welcome back. Last time we talked about the principles behind weathering, how rocks break down and change shape and form due to the environment around them. This week we're going to talk about rocks and stone in urban environments and how they break down over time. We'll start off by talking about the different factors that influence urban weathering as well as refresh some of the processes that lead to urban weathering. Then we'll talk about some of the different visual indicators of urban weathering, how you can spot these changes in your day-to-day -day life. And finally, we'll talk about differential weathering or how rocks weather at different rates. To begin, I'll show two different examples of the effects of weathering on stoneworks. Uh, the first one shown here is St. Peter's Cathedral in Regensburg, Bavaria, Germany. Uh, it's currently undergoing extensive cleaning and repairs to replace the green stained limestone blocks, which you can see here on the front of the church. Um, and these green stained blocks are being replaced with white stone blocks to match the original. As you might imagine, this is not a, an easy or a cheap process, but it's the kind of thing that becomes necessary after a period of time when dealing with stone in an urban environment. Uh, the second example here is St. Paul's Cathedral in London. Uh, in the picture on the left, you can see the heavily stained uh, limestone, Portland limestone is the type of limestone that this is. Uh, and it was cleaned and restored over a 15 year period, resulting in the image that you can see here on the right. Notice how much uh, cleaner the stone looks in comparison to the, to the older photo. Um, this whole process cost about 40 million pounds and it was only completed in June 2011. Uh, so in the rest of this lecture, we're going to talk about what causes stonework to decay, what causes it to become discolored, uh, and then change form. So urban weathering is influenced by a number of different things. Uh, we can broadly categorize this into three different factors. The first is the local environment. This determines the climate and the different types and amounts of pollutants in the air. The second is the characteristics of the construction, how the building or how the stonework is uh, built, how it, what shape it has, the size of the stonework, uh, the texture of the surface, all of this has a say in how the stone will weather. And then finally, the type of stone used is also a very important factor. Uh, as we've talked about, different rocks and minerals are more or less susceptible to different types of weathering in the natural environment. And this, of course, remains true in the urban environment. As in real estate, location matters a great deal. Uh, the main contributors to weathering in an urban environment, much as in the natural environment, are water, contaminants or pollutants in the atmosphere, salts, thermal changes, and wind. As we will discuss in more detail, water and atmospheric pollution, uh, the, the combination of water and atmospheric pollution leads to the formation of salt crystals, uh, which can help to physically and mechanically change the composition of rocks. These crystals form via evaporation, which is heavily influenced by the amount of water available, the solar in insulation or the amount of sunlight that the surface gets, uh, the temperature, and even wind. Uh, each of these different processes can play a role and sort of play off of each other uh, to help break down rocks and stoneworks over time. In the past century or so, we have learned that rates of stone decay are dramatically increased in polluted environments, such as many urban areas. Uh, this helps to bring the natural land lifespan of stone down from several tens of thousands of years to only a few decades in the most extreme circumstances. Uh, the biggest reason for this is atmospheric pollution. Well, the atmosphere in an urban area contains many impurities, such as sulfur, sulfur nitrogen oxide, ammonia, carbon dioxide, different chlorides. Um, all of these compounds can combine with water such as the humidity in the air or rain uh, to chemically weather stone. Um, because these impurities are especially concentrated in urban areas due in part to the prevalence of uh, industry or car exhaust, burning of fuel for home heating, <clears throat> these problems become much greater in an urban area. Um, the impurities 
uh, that we're talking about can come from both anthropogenic sources, so human-caused sources, I mentioned industry, car exhaust, uh, home heating, and so on, uh, but they can also come from natural sources, such as from volcanoes, uh, volcanic eruptions give off uh, particulate matter, they give off different gases that uh, can form acids in the atmosphere, as well as dust from other sources. So the major cause of accelerated stone decay in urban environments is acid rain. So acid rain occurs when pollutants combine with moisture in the atmosphere to form different acids. Um, acids plus wet stone lead to acid deposition, which then leads to either solution weathering, where the acid works to dissolve the minerals in the stone, or salt weathering, where salt crystals form on the surface of the stone and then either mechanically break it apart or further chemically alter it. Uh, and it, as we have talked about in the previous lectures, these are not mutually exclusive processes either. Um, we'll get into an example later where we discuss uh, how both of these processes combine in an especially potent and common weathering process. Um, as with the other things that we we're talking about, these, these processes are not exclusive to urban environments. Again, it's just a much bigger problem in urban environments because of the higher concentrations of pollutants in the atmosphere. So I mentioned that another factor that influences how stone and how buildings weather um, is the uh, characteristics of the building. So buildings all have different characteristics. They have a different orientation, so the direction uh, that the different sides of the building are facing. Uh, they have different foundations, so what the building is built on. Um, they have different heights, different shapes, different textures. Uh, for example, you could have a uh, highly decorated uh, church wall, for example, or we could just have a very plain flat stone wall. Uh, and each of those different characteristics is going to influence how quickly the stone decays, and it influences how quickly the stone decays irrespective of the uh, sort of chemical or mineral properties of the stone. So starting with orientation, uh, the orientation can help determine the humidity on the face of a wall or on the face of a building. So north-facing facades tend to be more humid than south-facing facades, at least in the northern hemisphere. Uh, this difference in humidity influences growth rates for mosses and lichens, which leaves north-facing walls more susceptible to biological weathering. Uh, of course, south-facing walls are then more exposed to stronger insulation, so they get more sunlight, uh, again, at least in the northern hemisphere, which then makes them more susceptible to uh, thermal weathering. So the, the repeated expansion and contraction as a result of insulation uh, can cause thermal fatigue or thermal shock, which helps to break the uh, stonework apart. The building's foundation is also an important factor. So if you're familiar with building practices, you know that the foundation can affect the overall strength of the building. Uh, if, the, if the foundation is weak or bad, uh, it leads to further structural damage. Uh, you can see an example of that here, where the foundation of this building has settled, and you can see all of the cracks and fractures uh, that are propagating up through the building as a result of this settling process. Um, just as in the natural environment, these sorts of fractures, which are just mechanical damage to the rock or mechanical damage to the structure, uh, those processes open up more surface area to be exposed to chemical weathering or to further mechanical weathering, which of course increases the rate and the efficiency of the weathering processes. Building geometry also plays a big role in this. Uh, the shape of the building, the surface detail can determine how much of that surface is exposed to wind and rain, uh, how much it's exposed to moisture, as well as the airflow, atmospheric pollution. Um, so this surface detail can have a major effect on the soiling patterns as well. Uh, you can see this image here 
showing how soiling is much stronger. So we see much more of this uh, black crust developing underneath this small windowsill or lentil um, as compared to the flat faces of the bricks. Similarly, if we see stronger soiling in the spaces between these stone blocks uh, than we see on the faces of the stone blocks. So again, the surface detail plays a big role in how soiling happens, how different crusts can form, uh, and how ultimately the blocks weather and decay. Similarly, the direction that the wall is facing also leads to different processes and different ways of weathering, as we can see in this picture uh, here. So we see two different sides of this building. They have clearly different patterns in the soiling of the limestone around these windows. On this side, you see that the limestone is uh, this nice cream or nearly white color, so there's not very much soiling. Um, on this side of the building, we can see that the, uh, that the limestone is very heavily soiled. It's almost black. And these are the same stones. They're just facing different directions, so they're experiencing different processes. Um, so when we have sheltered facades or sheltered walls of the building, um, these can be less. Ex these tend to be less exposed to wind and rain, which means that they hold on to moisture and pollutants longer. So there's more time where moisture and pollutants are sitting on the surface, which means there's more time for salt solutions to soak into the stone, which gives it more access to chemical and mechanical weathering. On the other hand, if a facade is exposed to the elements, so if it's facing the sun or if it's available, uh, if it's open for rainfall, um, then the rain washes the stone. So it doesn't allow these pollutants to sit there, but that washing, repeated washing by the rain causes dissolution weathering. Similarly, if it's exposed to the wind, it can cause mechanical erosion. Of course, the type of stone used is also important. Different characteristics lead to different levels of resistance in weathering. So how minerals are arranged helps determine the porosity of the stone, which is how easily it can absorb water and allow salt crystals to form. Uh, crystal or mineral hardness also plays a big role as well as the tendency of the mineral to form cleavage planes. Uh, so these small individual layers that form. Uh, the more planes in the, in the mineral, the more places where water and salts can get in and help break the rock down. A good example of the differences in stone characteristics that determine the resistance to decay uh, is shown here with these two tombstones. So the tombstone on the left is made out of granite, which is mostly composed of quartz. And the one on the right is made out of marble, which is mostly composed of calcium carbonate or calcite. Um, so the granite headstone looks significantly uh, in better condition. It's uh, still fairly fresh looking. We can see the, the inscription uh, fairly easily on it, and it was erected in 1868. The one on the right uh, was erected four years later, so in 1872, so it is actually younger than the granite headstone, but because of the material that was used, marble, uh, it has weathered much, much more than the granite, and so it is the, the inscription on it is almost illegible in comparison to the one on the granite. Uh, the, the way that minerals are bound together within a rock matters as well. So quartz is very resistant to weathering, uh, but when it's bound up in sedimentary rocks like sandstone, quartz crystals are held together by different binding minerals, so different clays, for example. Um, and those binding minerals might not be as resistant to weathering as the quartz crystals. So if that binder decays, if it breaks down, then the whole stone can disintegrate. Uh, insert wise comment about being only being as strong as the weakest link here.
A study was put together at Queen's University in Belfast to compare the durability of different stone types to salt weather. So they simulated cycles of wetting and drying with a salt solution in a climate cabinet, this little box that allows them to control how much uh, simulated rain each of the different stone samples gets. Uh, they could control the temperature, they could control how much airflow was going through and so on. So they were able to, to put these stone samples in a controlled environment where they could easily measure the weight lost by each stone type. And so what they found was that the stone properties determined how much weight was lost. So how much of the stone was weathered away in this experiment. Uh, the physical strength and the porosity of the different stones uh, determines how much of the solution was absorbed and how quickly it was able to migrate through the stone. So that's, that is to say that the more pores that the rock has, the more solution is held within those pores, the more salts can form and the deeper that they can penetrate. So the more damage they can do within the stone structure. Um, the graph here um, on the right hand side of the screen shows the differences in uh, percent weight loss for each of the different rock types over the number of days that they ran this experiment. And you can see that there's a very big uh, spread in how much of the different, uh, how much of these different stones were weathered away. So we're going from basalt and granite, which had almost no percent weight loss, so pretty much flat at zero here, uh, to Portland limestone, which had about 1% over the same period of time, uh, down to the Banque Royale limestone at 4%. And then Lorphalin and Scrabo sandstone, Lorphalin limestone and Scrabo sandstone uh, both lost well over 10% of their weight over the course of this experiment. Um, you can also see that there's a big range for each of the different limestones or each of the different, um, yeah, for each of the different limestones. Um, so Portland limestone like the limestone that makes up St. Paul's Cathedral, which we saw earlier in the lecture, uh, that did pretty well with only, as I said, about 1% weight loss. Uh, compared to a different form of limestone, uh, Lorphalin limestone, which had nearly 14% weight loss. And part of this is due to how, more, how much more porous uh, Lorphalin limestone is than Portland. So Lorphalin limestone is at about 20% porosity, uh, as compared to about 2% for the other two types of limestone in this study, so Portland and the Bank Royale. Other factors related to stone structure can assume greater importance than porosity. For example, if we have a sedimentary rock that has different bedding planes within it, um, that can cause different rates of decay, uh, especially based on how those bedding planes are oriented. Um, so if you look at these examples of uh, the arrangements of different bedding planes, uh, you can see option A, we have what's called normal bedding, where the bedding planes are placed horizontally. Option B, we have the bedding planes placed vertically, but they are um, perpendicular to the face of the wall. And option C, we have vertically placed joints that are parallel to the wall surface. So this is what's called face bedding. Um, so for options A and B, we can get a sort of furrowed appearance where the, the different layers uh, represented by these bedding planes can erode at different rates. So it kind of accentuates these, these joints that we can see. Um, but for option C, if we have weathering that happens along those bedding planes, we can actually lose the complete layer. So it can become weak and just fall off. And you can see an example of that here at uh, Newtonard's Town Hall. Uh, we have blocks of sandstone. The dark colored blocks are older, they're stained and weathered, uh, but you can see these light colored blocks. And these are blocks that were placed uh, in a face bedding arrangement. And you can see that the uh, complete pieces of these blocks have fallen off, uh, exposing the fresh stone 
underneath. Um, I think this has since been replaced, so it no longer looks like this, but this is one of the examples of the ways, the different ways that the stone structure can have an effect on how quickly the stone weathers. So I think this is probably a good place to take a break. Um, so go ahead and pause the video and uh, come back in a few minutes. All right, welcome back. So here uh, I've again listed some of the different uh, main decay or weathering agents that we've covered uh, and just to sort of reintroduce them as we talk a little bit more about the different processes. Um, so the first one, uh, perhaps the most important, is water. Uh, as we talked about, water can induce chemical or physical or mechanical changes in rock uh, through a variety of processes. Another important weathering agent is heat. So this produces thermal changes in the rock, which can cause the propagation of fractures through thermal fatigue. Um, salts, which we have talked about and will continue talking about through the rest of this lecture, have various influences, both chemical and mechanical. Uh, biological activity, similarly, both chemical and mechanical uh, impacts on rocks and on weathering. And then finally, uh, wind. Well, we didn't cover wind very much in the previous lectures, uh, but wind can cause mechanical weathering through what's known as abrasion. So we have small particles of sand or dust or other things um, that are carried along by the wind, and they can actually scour rock surfaces, um, much the same way that we talked about with glaciers, where glaciers pick up small sediments and small rocks and actually scrape along bedrock as they flow. Um, so it's a similar type of process. So water uh, is the primary agent of stone decay, as I mentioned. Uh, it has different sources in nature, either through rain, through atmospheric moisture, uh, through groundwater. And the movement of water is controlled by, among other things, uh, gravity, capillary forces, or atmospheric humidity and heat, so different atmospheric properties as well. And we'll talk about each of these uh, as we continue along. So starting with uh, rainwater, rain, as we've touched on uh, in previous lectures, uh, rain can chemically dissolve or mechanically erode stone surfaces. So when it's in the atmosphere, rainwater can combine with, uh, with different molecules or compounds to form relatively weak acids. So in the range, uh, pH range between 4.5 and 5.6. In the urban environment, because of the high concentrations of different pollution pollutants, uh, rainwater can actually create much more aggressive acids. Um, so, for example, uh, rain combining with CO2 or higher concentrations of CO2 forms carbonic acid. Uh, if it's uh, combining with sulfur dioxide, we can form, form sulfuric acid. Uh, combining with various nitrous oxides, it can form nitric acid. So each of these different acids help to produce mineral corrosion and further the decay or accelerate the decay of stone surfaces in an urban environment. Um, another way that water can impact stone surfaces is through humidity, so water vapor in the atmosphere. This can lead to condensation on stone surfaces, especially in uh, areas that are relatively sheltered, um, which can help bind dust and other pollutant particles to the surface. Um, so that leads to soiling, like what we've seen on the different examples from the cathedrals at the beginning of the lecture, uh, or thick salt crust that we'll talk about a little bit later on. Um, this condensation typically is stronger in sheltered areas, as I mentioned, because condensation happens a little bit easier in sheltered areas. Uh, so, for example, under windowsills, under arches, under uh, lintels or cornices on the sides of buildings. And that can lead to significantly longer duration of wetness on a surface, which allows uh, the further or the the 
deeper penetration of salts into the rock, the further absorption of these different solutions. Um, related to this is what's called occult deposition, uh, where we have deposits that are happening in sheltered hidden areas, so areas that are hidden away from uh, rain uh, specifically. Uh, so these deposits tend to be more acidic than rainwater because of the higher concentration, um, and they can also reach areas where rain doesn't reach. Um, so because rain doesn't reach, the salts that form are less likely to be washed away, and that makes them more damaging to the rock surface than, in an expo than, than it is on an exposed surface because it's able to sit there longer to form uh, more and bigger crystals and, again, propagate deeper into the stone. Uh, just an example of this being shown um, here, we have uh, one of the um, gates in the dairy walls. I believe this is the ferry key gate um, or this wall here on Artillery Street just next to the ferry key gate. And you can see this dark black crust that's forming on the stone. And this is gypsum. Uh, which we'll talk a little bit more about later on, and we also mentioned in one of the previous lectures. Um, and I've included a link at the end of the uh, lecture where you can actually go and, and have a look at these with uh, Google Street View, since at the moment we're not able to, to get there in person. So groundwater can also enter stoneworks via what's called capillary action. Um, so this is moisture that is being uh, wicked or um, pulled through pores in the rock uh, by attentional forces. Um, this has a significant impact, of course, on porous rocks, and it has been measured in sandstone to reach as high as seven meters above the ground surface. So water is actually basically sucked up seven meters from the ground through the stone. Um, where this happens here in this picture, uh, we can see there's a clear line of staining uh, on either side of this doorway. So this dark brown giving way to the lighter brown color. Um, this is a result of groundwater being uh, again uh, pulled into the uh, pulled into the stone uh, via this capillary action. Um, you can also see efflorescence. efflorescence so this is salt deposition on the surface, and you can see this much closer to the ground level in each of these two uh, pictures here. Um, again, we talked about efflorescence in the first lecture on weathering, the principles of weathering, and we'll talk a little bit more about it uh, in the next uh, little bit of this lecture. Um, so dissolution weathering because of chemical weathering can also lead to mechanical weathering. So remember that all of these different processes are sort of intertwined. None of them happens necessarily in a vacuum and they can feed into each other uh, and further damage stones. So remember that calcium carbonate, CaCO3, uh, dissolves in a solution of carbonic acid, so a mixture of water and carbon dioxide. Um, because calcium carbonate or calcite acts as a binder for many different minerals. So we talked about uh, marble, the marble tombstone that we saw on one of the previous slides in this lecture. Uh, another example is most limestones, uh, lime-based mortars. So the mortar that holds brick together uh, is often uh, made out of calcium carbonate rich material. Uh, same thing with some concretes uh, that are very prevalent in urban environments, and it's also prevalent in some sandstones. So this is a fairly common mineral in a lot of the rocks that we like to build with. Um, so when calcium carbonate dissolves, um, other minerals that are held together uh, in this matrix can detach. Um, so they basically fall off of the, of the rock because the binder holding them together has, has disintegrated. And this process is what's known as granular disintegration because we're sort of breaking the rock apart little pieces at a time. So you can see some examples of that here, uh, this picture of sandstone from a university in Aachen, Germany. Um, so this sort of pebbled, 
texture that you can see on the surface of the sandstone. Um, this has happened as a result of granular disintegration. Uh, and you can see similar uh, pattern or similar features on this granite block. Uh, I think this is a picture from the university in Dublin. Um, so this process doesn't just happen because of dissolution weathering. It can also happen because of temperature changes. So the um, granules expand or contract more, the, the different grains expand or contract more than the binder holding them together, which causes them to, to break apart. Um, we can also get carbonate crusts, uh, sometimes called flow stones, that are forming on stone surfaces. Uh, these are forming because of dissolution or because of salt weathering. Um, so here uh, we have water within the stone uh, structure. Um, that water, as temperature increases, um, be, it gets wicked to the surface, so it moves to the surface uh, of the stone, which helps to bring different soluble minerals to the surface. And when the water evaporates uh, from the from the outside of the stone or from the surface of the stone, um, the minerals that are left get precipitated, uh, which, in, depending on what kind of soluble mineral we're talking about, can form efflorescence blooms if it's a salt, or if it's uh, calcium carbonate, it can form this carbonate crust. Um, so you can see that here in this picture. So these stone steps, uh, and I think actually they're they're concrete steps. Um, so this this crust that's forming, this um, sort of white textured surface, uh, is forming because calcium carbonate is actually being leached out of the concrete by water that is penetrating into the uh, into the concrete, and then it's deposited at the surface in this thick crust. So when these crusts form, um, they are impermeable. So water can't get out from underneath them. Um, so that helps to prevent internal evaporation within the uh, within the stone. So the water is sort of any any moisture in the stone is sort of trapped inside. It, it has a harder time getting out, um, which causes further dissolution of the minerals or of soluble minerals within the stone structure, uh, which can then cause a whole layers to sort of fall off and detach in this process called scaling. Uh, and you can see what that looks like in these different examples uh, here. So I mentioned gypsum uh, in both previous lectures and in a previous slide. Um, so gypsum, again, is a mineral that forms through the combination of sulfuric acid and calcium carbonate. Um, so gypsum is a hydrate, so it can combine with water molecules to grow in size. So it's a, um, it's a salt that can grow through hydration. Uh, again, we talked about this in the mechanical weathering uh, set of lectures. Um, so gypsum forms a dark crust on stone surfaces. It can incorporate uh, different pollutant particles like soot or fly ash. Um, so this, uh, di this example here, this image shows a scanning electron micrograph, so a very close up view of the surface of this, um, of this gypsum. And you can see this spherical particle in the middle and that's actually a fly ash particle. So that's a, a particle that is left behind by the burning of coal in a, in particular in an urban environment. Um, so when gypsum forms, it helps lead to salt weathering, again, either by crystallizing within rock pores or hydration. So it absorbs water into the crystal structure and then grows, uh, expanding more than the rock around it. Um, or it can also uh, lead to salt weathering by thermal expansion. Um, and as I mentioned already, this can build up significantly in areas that are sheltered and exposed to moisture. So again, if you, if you go and follow the link at the end of the slides uh, and look at uh, some of the examples from, um, from the dairy walls, uh, you can see these big 
crusts forming on the underside of archways um, and in sort of hidden areas around the walls. Um, and this again is called occult deposition. So there are many ways that we can recognize salt weathering as we're looking at buildings uh, sort of in our everyday life or if you're out traveling, if we're ever able to do that again. Um, and you can see that showing up in different ways. So it, remember salt crystallizes in the pore spaces within a rock. It pries apart the grains of the, uh, the, the mineral grains of the rock, uh, which can then either break the rock off or enhance other forms of weathering. Um, when stone dries slowly, salt solutions can migrate through the stone before they evaporate um, and accumulate either at or just below the surface, which causes the breakdown or disaggregation of mineral grains. This can show up, for example, as these honeycomb or alveolar features um, in stone. So this sort of um, really cool looking honeycomb structure uh, that happens as a result of salt weathering. Um, we see this not just in urban environments, but also in a lot of natural environments, especially around coasts uh, where we get salts coming from, uh, from ocean spray uh, at the shoreline. Um, if the stone is more homogeneous rather than granular, um, instead of getting this honeycomb structure, we might get these sort of thin flakes or scales developing um, that fall off. When we have sufficient water, water-soluble salts, again, they form a solution, they come to the surface, they form deposits when the water evaporates. And when we're talking about salts, this is what's known as an efflorescence. Uh, this can cause, again, granular disintegration through all of the different processes that we have talked about. Uh, if the pores are blocked by, as the example that I mentioned earlier, uh, calcium carbonate crusts, um, we can get what's known as contour scaling. So here we have this thick crust that breaks away from the face of the stone. Uh, it looks similar to what happens when we have uh, face bedding. So remember, we've taken a, a block of stone that has internal layers, and we've turned it so that the internal layers are parallel to the direction that the wall, or they're parallel to the wall surface. Um, but in this case, it happens irrespective of the way that the bed, uh, of the different bedding surfaces are lying. Again, because this has more to do with the crust forming on the surface of the stone than it does with the pre-existing rock structure. Another impact of weathering in urban environments, and one that is often a uh, pain to have to clean up uh, if you're a, a council or city government, uh, is what is known as staining. Um, so this is the discoloration of the surface as a result of chemical changes in the rock. Uh, so most often uh, in an urban environment, we have either green or brown stains. Um, brown, of course, is caused by usually the oxidation of iron. Um, so this is rust that's forming at the surface of the rock as a result of iron being leached from minerals within the rock, uh, where it ends up coming to the surface and oxidizing. Um, it can also be sourced from uh, iron or steel reinforcements that are often used in building. Um, but either way, we get, uh, we get this oxidation of iron, which discolors the rock. Uh, similarly, we can get green stains forming because of the oxidation of copper. Uh, most often this is coming from external feature, fixtures, uh, so things like lightning rods or copper roofs, uh, rather than the minerals within the rocks. Um, so finally, we come to uh, this concept of differential weathering. We've kind of touched on it a little bit. Uh, throughout each of the, throughout the rest of this, this lecture, because remember, different rocks, different features are weathering at different rates. And so this weathering process can amplify or heighten the differences in rocks or materials 
which is known as differential weathering. Uh, an example from the natural world, which we've covered previously, is the formation of a volcanic neck. Um, example we saw on the field trip to Valley Castle and Giant's Causeway uh, was the Carica Reed rope bridge. So that, um, that island that the bridge leads to is a volcanic neck that formed. Um, hopefully you can remember, hopefully you remember that these are formed when we have magma that solidifies in a fissure or in a, um, in a volcanic conduit over millions of years, the weaker material surrounding that, uh, that solidified magma erodes away and we are left with this harder volcanic material exposed at the surface, um, leaving these large neck features. Uh, example uh, image here is uh, Shiprock in New Mexico in the U.S. Um, differential weathering can also happen because of structural differences, uh, even in rocks that have the same mineral composition. So the spacing and depth of joints at the surface can play a big role here. Um, remember in a previous lecture, we talked about the concept of spherical or spheroidal weathering. Um, so remember that weathering processes act more quickly on corner features than they do on edge features. Uh, which act more quickly than they do on faces, on rock faces. And the reason for this is because the rock is vulnerable from three different directions in the case of a corner, or two different directions in the case of, a, uh, of an edge, or one direction in the case of a face. Um, so those differences in rates of weathering end up leading to different landforms like what we see uh, in this example here, uh, these nice uh, rounded boulder features uh, that have formed in Joshua Tree National Park in the US. And of course, this can happen in an urban environment as well. Uh, this is amplified further by the accelerated rates of weathering that we've, that we've talked about. Um, so the major causes of differential weathering in urban settings are, for example, the uneven distribution of cement or concrete, the accumulation of weak minerals within rock layers, or the uneven arrangement of blocks. So we have bedding planes that are placed in different orientations, which will lead to different rates of weathering. Uh, differential weathering is especially common in sedimentary rocks with different layers or different strata. Um, so the pre-existing layer boundaries provide avenues for water and salts to get in between the layers, and then softer layers or softer beds will erode more readily, and you end up with these sorts of uh, features that are shown here. So here you can see where the different layers in this sandstone wall are, have decayed more than others. So arrows pointing to a stone that is fairly intact as opposed to stones that have uh, either decayed away or fallen out. Um, so one potential reason for there being so much more decay uh, at lower levels of the wall, so again, the, the weathering is increasing as we go down the face of the wall, um, is that at the base of the wall, uh, it's more sheltered. Um, so water can stay longer on the surface and you can also get more moisture as a result of rain so when rain falls, um, it sort of comes down and bounces back up and it can stick to the wall, which helps to prolong the presence of water on the surface of the wall, um, which, is a, which leads to faster weathering than in other circumstances. Um, so something to maybe think about is looking at this, can you think of some other potential reasons why we might see faster rates of weathering uh, at the base of the wall as opposed to the top of the wall. So that is it for urban stone decay. I put a few different links here for you to check out. Um, the first is a link to a page from Queen's University in Belfast uh, that talks a little bit more about the different concepts that we've covered. The second two links are Google Street View links.
So the first one again goes to the walls in Derry, and you can have a look at uh, the different weathering patterns that you can see on the walls there. Um, you can kind of zoom around. I think the um, because the because the walls are right next to streets, you can see an awful lot of them, uh, at least more than uh, some other things in other areas. And the second example is one of the many different. Um, one of the many different sort of street views that you can see of the forum in Rome. Um, so you, again, you can have a look around, you can uh, jump to some of the different monuments and look at the different weathering patterns there um, and think about the different processes that we've talked about and maybe try to explain some of the differences that you can see. Um, in the field trips folder on Blackboard, there's also more material to look at. Uh, there's a weathering atlas that covers the different ways that stone decays as a result of weathering and what those different features look like. Um, but I hope that you found this interesting and helpful. And as always, don't hesitate to contact me if you have questions or comments or concerns or whatever. Um, so thank you. Bye.